Lola, and I like hockey, baking, volleyball, and hanging out with my friends. My name is Morris, and I like to play hockey, soccer. I like to scooter with my friends and go to the skate park and play frisbee golf. As a family, we like to play frisbee golf down at the beach. We like doing puzzles, board games in the evenings. And then we also like watching movies and series on TV together. Usually my mom mostly makes the dinners, but sometimes we make dinners together. Like we did pita pizzas sometimes. The pandemic started and lots of people, they didn't have their jobs because they couldn't like work in with other people. And so we decided to come up with a pantry. The pantry, so you build it and then you put it in your yard. People can bring food and take it if they need it. Me and my dad like, got like screws and wood and built like the actual structure and then I painted the pantry. And my mom designed it. She put like the letters in and then she stocks it up once in a while when it's empty and stuff. The message on the pantry says, take what you need and add what you can. Because some people don't have a lot of food and like they need it, so they can come to the pantry and take anything they need for to help them with what they're going through. The food that's in there will be available to anyone who needs it. Sometimes I see people like come and drive up and put food in the pantry, or like I see people come with their kids and like the kids put the food in and yeah. One person, well, we didn't see them, but they came by and they wrote inside the pantry, thank you so much, because they were like really grateful for like the food that other people can take and like to help them with what they're going through. Yeah. We want to love our neighbors like Jesus did. And so um, we saw that another person left a note in our mailbox and said, if we could give them tips on how to build a pantry um, for their church to help others like we did. My mom emailed them and they responded and I think the Pastor said, it's a practical way to love others. If you don't have the materials or you don't want to like build a whole pantry, then you can also just put like food on your curb or like the your property and people can come by, take some, and just so then you can help others, but like you don't have to build like a whole box to like keep it in. So you can just put it on your curb and have others come and take it if they need it. Or you could help your neighbors by like bringing their trash bin or bringing it out or shoveling their driveway if there's snow or, or something. Yeah, I think we'll continue it because lots of people like to come by and add stuff, but also like take it. And that's like the most important part. And like just seeing people come by is like really nice because like we know that they need it. So to continue it would be really helpful for them. We wanted to be more like Jesus and help others like he helped lots of people um, as we read in the Bible. So we want to be more like him and help others in our street and yeah. Good morning and welcome to the Meeting House live stream. I'm Dan Fenty, and I'm on the video production team here at The Meeting House. I love that story from Lola and Morris. I think it is such a great example of what bringing the kingdom looks like in real and tangible ways. Meeting people's needs is one of the ways that we show Jesus' love to others. And that's what we're all about here with this peacemaking series. To date, we have now raised $92,895 towards our goal of $150,000. That is an incredible achievement. And we still have a Sunday of giving left, so that number is gonna grow even more. One of the ways that we're supporting peace building here at the Meeting House through MCC is by investing in peace building ministries in Sub-Saharan Africa. And a specific way 
is peace clubs and peace uh, initiatives that are being conducted in the Zambian Correctional Service. This morning, we have an interview between our compassion coordinator, Megan Enns, and Jason Sapolwa, who runs one of these programs in the Zambian prisons. Let's check that video out now. Hi, I'm Megan Enns, and I'm a compassion manager here at the Meeting House, and we're chatting today with Jason Sapolwa. So Jason, tell us, what's your role with MCC, and where are you currently working? Currently, I am working with MCC as the project coordinator for Zambia Correctional Service and Braveheart Foundation. I work alongside the Zambia Correctional Service, the national level project management team, in implementing MCC's restorative justice and peace building project. So you work with restorative justice in correctional institutions. Tell us a bit more about that. In a bid to promote peace and break cycles of violence and re-offending, correctional facilities in Zambia are undergoing a paradigm shift from a punitive system to a more correctional model. The correctional model assumes that crime is caused by social, psychological, and environmental factors that require treatment hence the adoption of restorative justice in correctional facilities. So in restorative justice, we respond to wrongdoing by endeavoring to repair the harm caused by crime. Therefore, we seek to address the root causes of crime. We start by training facilitators on restorative justice and peace building, and thereafter they are, they are mandated to form peace clubs in their respective correctional facilities. Can you tell us a story of your work? One successful story that we have, there was a gentleman in prison who was sentenced for five years for theft. And so he came forward that he wanted to be reconciled with the victim. And by the virtue of telling the truth to the victim, the victim was so pleased to the extent of coming back every day to the facility just to visit him. The victim, also happened to be helping the family of the offender through this reconciliation and she was happy about having such a project in the prison. What fantastic stories of transformation and restoration for uh, the offender and for the community. How are victims supported through this work? In our project and the way we do it is that the victim also needs to be empowered when we go to meet the victim and we inform them about this project. We assess, is this person ready? If not, we also offer counseling services and we also offer support group systems to empower them. And also the A is answers. They need answers. Well, thank you so much for, for uh, chatting with us today, Jason, and sharing your work with us. We are uh, excited to be partnering with you through Peacemakers. I think it's so inspiring what Jason and his team are accomplishing in the Zambian Correctional Service. They're really showing the peace-building power of reconciliation and bringing God's kingdom in real and tangible ways. Another way you can be involved in the building of God's kingdom is by giving here at the Meeting House. And if you'd like to do that, you can do that at themeetinghouse.com slash give. We're headed now into a time of musical worship and teaching. Let's head there now.
sing a new song. I will sing, sing a new song. I will sing, sing a new song to the Lord. Let your kingdom come, let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Every heart proclaim the mercy of your name. me this morning that all three songs that we're singing together today are written as a prayer to the Lord. And so uh, some of these words could be considered dangerous in that they are action words, not passive words, not passive things that we're saying uh, to the ears of the Lord, but um, committing to take action. So as we pray and sing these next words, I just pray that uh, your heart will resonate with these words and it will propel us forward to take action. Come set your rule and reign in our hearts again. Increase in us, we pray. Unveil why we're made. Come set. church and we need your power in
say this morning if that is your prayer say yes god yes god oh beautiful build your kingdom here yes god father god we thank you for loving us so much that you want to bring heaven down here on earth god father this is our prayer this morning that you would build your kingdom here that you would fill and heal this hurting and broken world, Lord. Yes, God, we want to say yes to you, to move for you, to be that hope, to show the love and forgiveness that you have shown us, God. And so as we stand and we sing and as we pray and as we listen to your words this morning, God, I pray that you stir in all of our hearts, Lord, this action to move to not be passive, to not just sit, Lord, but to say yes, God, and to move for you and to be the hope and be the light of this world. Just stay right where I am and hope to feel you. Hope 
to feel something again. How come we can invent better ways to kill each other, but not one to preserve peace? Abjit Naskar P. 
peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. Jesus. An eye for an eye makes the whole world blind. Mahatma Gandhi. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called children of God. Jesus. When the power of love overcomes the love of power, the world will know peace. Jimi Hendrix. May mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. Jude chapter 1 verse 2. Peace cannot be achieved through violence. It can only be attained through understanding. Ralph Waldo Emerson. Peace be with you. Jesus. Well, peace be with you, brothers and sisters. Welcome to the final Sunday of our series, Peace, Peace, the Transcendent Work of God that Extends out into the world being a blessing, be the being of Christ, the Spirit of God that infuses his life within us with that we're an active, faithful, uh, gentle, peace-orienting presence in our neighborhoods with you, with you, with me, with us, that this is our calling as a church. As people who follow Jesus, we are meant to do something with the message of peace. So brothers and sisters, peace be with you. Peace be with you. Uh, it was about 10 years ago, I was newly on staff at the Meeting House, and this was the kind of conversation that we were having at the time. Um, and it wasn't something that like, was as good as it is uh, now. Joined to me to my left is Megan Enns, who's our compassion uh, manager. We're going to be hearing for her, from her in just a minute. And we're so thankful that the, for the work that you and your team have done, because like I said, it was not always this way. So I was meeting with my manager at the time, uh, here on staff, and we were talking about like, what does it mean for us to be a compassionately engaged and involved church across Ontario and around the world? Like, what does it mean for us to do? Uh, and my manager at the time and mentor uh, very plainly spoke that, like, it, despite all the things that are happening right now at the Meeting House and certainly have evolved over the years, it was not always this way. Our orientation towards peace and justice of compassionate engagement locally and globally came as a process of, like, turning over rocks, uncovering our blind spots and our misses as a church. And so he told me this story about, like, where this really all started for us as a church. It was a conversation with another church that had come to learn from the Meeting House as a church staff that had come up from the States to visit and learn about like multi-site and teaching and kids and youth uh, and a number of different things. And they spent a few days with our, with our director's team at the time. And at the end of the visit, they all sat down in one of our meeting rooms here. And they're like, this has been so great. Like teaching, we're getting it. We're getting it. Like the, you know, the nonviolent Jesus. It, it, we get it. We get it. You know, kids and youth. Yes, check, check. Multi-site. Amazing. How to grow and strategize. There's just one thing that seems to be missing from the conversation. And that's like... Um, how are you serving, as the meeting house, over a decade ago, how are you serving the poor? Like, how are you engaging in compassionate ministry in your local and global contexts? And my leader, mentor at the time, boss at the time was like, oh, well, you know, like we have home churches. Like home churches are like, is our main, main deal. And so I can tell you a couple stories of, you know, uh, some home churches that are serving crunchy peanut butter sandwiches to people who are living in poverty in downtown Toronto. Check. And he said, Jimmy, one by one, I just saw this whole team of people that had come to learn from the meeting house kind of close their binders, look back, and like not make eye contact. And so he's like, wait, what's going on here? Like, what, what, what are you guys doing? And he's like, oh, this leader with this church that come to learn from the meeting house said, no, no, that's great. I mean, you guys are making crunchy peanut butter sandwiches. I mean, our church, which is a lot smaller and doesn't have as many resources, um, has committed to at least 50% of us moving out of the suburbs and moving downtown into local poverty where we are and living with the poor to serve them as a lifestyle. But you guys are serving, you know, crunchy peanut butter sandwiches. It's a, it's a good start. So again, when we think about the evolution of the peace of Christ being with us as a, a movement, a mantra of our church, it was not always this way that God continues to speak, refine, and evolve uh, in our consciousness and how we work this out. Uh, so, Megan, to you, why peacemakers, to this very day, why peacemakers, and like how did this all come about? Where are we, and why today? 
That's a great question, Jimmy. So we've been running the annual Peacemakers campaign at the Meeting House and supporting MCC since 2007. Our original partnership with MCC was in the area of AIDS care. You might remember that back, back in the day. Yeah. Um, but MCC approached us and asked if we would consider funding their peace work. Well, one of our core values at the Meeting House is peace, so it was a logical fit. And since then, it's evolved. And as Carmen said at the beginning of this series, Peacemakers is really a sweet spot yeah, for us as a spot. church. Peace can often be hard to fund. If peace building is done well, there's impact in the community. But if you're not looking for it, you might miss it. And there's peace needed all over the world. Conflict is sometimes front page news, sometimes it doesn't even make the paper. It's needed on a big scale, and peace starts with small steps. Peacemaking is also integral to something we do as Christians. Peace is a fruit of the Spirit, and characteristic of someone who follows Jesus. As I see it, Peacemakers is a fantastic opportunity for us as a church to raise money and support peace building work in Ontario and around the world, and also to be building peace as we're going about our fundraising. It's a both and. Throughout this campaign, there have been so many examples of people coming together, using their gifts, and working, working together in such creative ways. Some of, the fun, some of the fundraisers we've seen have come out of people uh, using their gifts and sharing what they have. We've had an online auction going on, supported by many sites. Uh, and in that auction, there have been items both big and small. One family offered their cottage for a week. Someone else is a florist and offered a year's subscription of fresh flowers. I see you, all of those of you who outbid me on that one. <laughs> And uh, one family offered a sunset cruise of Lake Ontario on their sailboat. But it wasn't just people who had big things to offer. It was also people who had small things to offer, or smaller things to offer. Uh, one 10-year-old girl auctioned off a set of note cards that she had painted. A couple people auctioned off homemade pies. Someone else offered a dozen eggs and a chance to come meet their chickens. You laugh, but that's one of like that's the highest. Big, that's, that's like yeah. one of the biggest that's bidders like... right now. And some of the fundraisers have also been super creative. Uh, there have been some clothing swaps. Jimmy, there was an art sale in downtown Hamilton last night. Somebody hiked 200 kilometers over the month of May and invited people to sponsor her. One home church cycled 400 kilometers together. My family had a lemonade stand. And to me, one of the best parts of Peacemakers is seeing everyone come together, sharing what they have in support of a common goal. During our lemonade stand, my kids were out front from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. with a table, a jug of lemonade, and a few cups, and their toy cash register. Throughout the day, uh, we offered lemonade to everyone, regardless of whether or not they had any money. And it was fantastic to see the woman who had just moved onto our street a few months ago chatting with the family that's lived there for 10 years. We put the water toys out on the driveway, mostly to give us something to do while business was slow. <laughs> and uh, by the end of the day, I had eight kids, ranging in age from 18 months to 12 years old, watering my garden together for fun. Mm. If that's not peace building, I don't know what is. So while we've been doing an amazing job raising money for MCC, together we've raised about $100,000 in a month. That's something to be celebrated. Woo. And there's still more to be counted. We've also been building peace in our neighborhoods, in our communities, and in our church. Yeah, that's yeah, amazing. And we can get locked into this notion that like peace is an add-on to what our faith is, but pe peace was like a, it became a common greeting, extending peace or passing the peace in the early church, um, post-resurrected uh, uh, Christ, like that first um, few weeks and days, months, this became like how we remind and greet each other. So I'm going to ask you to do something. Uh, I know for the extroverts in the room, this is like, yay, we get to interact with each other. For the introverts, you're like, we hope we never see Jimmy again. Um, <laughs> I'm going to give you an option. So has anybody heard of this idea of passing the peace? Yes, a few of us. So what you do, it's very complicated. You'll stand, you put out your hand, you shake somebody else's hand, and you say, peace be 
with you. Now, if you're introverted and you're like, I hate this idea, I wish no one peace, you can wink at somebody in your aisle or give them a fist bump. So everybody stand up, somebody next to you, shake their hand and say, peace be with you. Shake their hand and say, peace be with you. Peace be peace with be you, with my you friend. Jimmy. So good. Good job. Very good, very good. All right, we're going to jump right into our text this morning, and you'll see why what we just did is so important. So our two central texts, both for this morning and this series, have been out of, out of the, the last chapter of Luke and the tail end of John. And so you'll see them on the screen here, but if you want to take out your Bible, whether here or at one of our locations, uh, like I said, Luke 24, verses 35 and 37, and then you're going to flip over to John chapter 20, verses 19 and 21. I'm going to read them all together, and then we're going to navigate through, like, why are these so significant, and what does it have to do with what we just did, and hopefully what we continue to do as a community of faith together as it relates to peace. Okay, so Luke 24, 35 to 37. Luke 24, 35 to 37, and then John 20, 19 to 21. While they were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them, and he said to them, let's say it together, peace, peace be, with, be you. with you. They were startled. They were frightened. Isn't that fascinating? They were afraid. They thought they'd seen a ghost, and he said to them, why are you troubled? Why are you scared? Why do your doubts rise in your minds? Look at my hands, my feet. It's me. It's me. Touch me and see, a ghost doesn't have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And then flipping over to John's gospel. On the evening of that first day of the week when the disciples were together, with the doors locked out of fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, and we say it together, peace, peace be, be with, with you. you. And after he said this, he showed them his hands and his side, and the disciples were overjoyed then that they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, and we say it together, peace, peace be, be with, with you. you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. Now, this is a fascinating, fascinating text. We don't hear Jesus say this phrase ever in any of the Gospels, in any of the record of his teaching up until this point. Have you noticed that? This comes after his resurrection has taken place, and it is a, it's a mitigation of fear and insecurity. So in the first uh, section that we read in Luke's gospel, Jesus has been crucified, buried, dead, resurrected. The women uh, see him. They hear of his resurrection. They go back and tell the disciples. And in both accounts, the disciples don't really believe. And so in Luke's gospel, we read that there's these two other disciples, followers of Jesus, who are unnamed, and they're on the Emmaus Road. They are fleeing the city. It's a wrap. It's done. The church is done. We're done. Our leader's gone. Done. Story over. Let's go back to what we've been a part of all along, which is likely farming, um, agriculture, sowing seeds. They're headed to a, an undisclosed location, and Jesus meets them on their way and starts to explain and explain and explain, like, how does the Messiah thing work? How does this all come together? And then he eats a meal with them, and he breaks bread, and their eyes are open, and Jesus disappears, and then they head back to Jerusalem to meet with the disciples and say, yo, that's a paraphrase, uh, this, this, this has changed now, this has changed now. We saw the risen Lord, and then Jesus appears in front of them and says, peace be with you. And then in John's gospel, the same thing has happened. The women uh, are the first uh, gospel tellers, the storytellers of the resurrected Christ, and they go back to tell the disciples because the disciples don't believe. Peter runs, and so does John. They, they see something, they come back, and they lock themselves in the upper room. They're safe and quiet and protected place, and Jesus appears to them and says, peace be with you. Now, why is this? I would contend that it's part and parcel of what we just did together. So we all just shook hands. Isn't that a fascinating thing that we do in our culture? Like we extend our hands and fingers and we interlock with somebody else's flesh and we greet them and we shake. We shake. Isn't that fascinating? Like you would never like try and link toes or feet and shake somebody's <laughs> feet. But there, there's something there. It comes from um, most, historians, most historians would say between the third and fifth century uh, in ancient Greece and it was a symbol that you didn't have a gun. You didn't have a weapon. You didn't have a sword. You didn't have something to, to hurt somebody else. And then certainly uh, in the West and in our context, it became one of those ways that like, you know, in the wild, wild West, for back, lack of a better description, it showed that you didn't have, yeah, like a gun with bullets in it. None of this applies to us today, right? 
It showed that you came with peace on your mind, that you saw somebody as another human being, no fear on your mouth or in your mind. This is an equal greeting. We are okay with each other. I'm here to help, not to hurt, not to harm. I'm here to help, not to hurt, not to harm. Let's shake hands. There's nothing in my hand. I'm not here to take over or oppress or kill you. I'm here to help and serve you. Jesus appears as a resurrected Messiah. Now, if you know your ancient Jewish history, which we all do, uh, what was the, the, the messianic complex that the Jews at the time, the Israelites, expected? A warrior, a warrior, a God that would come back, not necessarily resurrect, but a God that would, that, that, that would come in human form on planet Earth, a, a, a leader that would come and, and renew, restore, overthrow Rome reinstate Israel back into her place uh, as the, the leader of the kingdom of all nations, of all nations, and that this Messiah would be a fighter. Now, think about that. You have that complex as a first disciple. You have that complex. That's how you're thinking of the Messiah. You've never thought about the resurrection. It hasn't been clear to you in the scripture, and then your Messiah leader doesn't conquer doesn't take over, doesn't oppress the oppressors, but instead disappears, but then all of a sudden is resurrected in your midst. All you know about the Messiah is somebody who will come and take over a, a, a spiritual leader for sure, but a government leader is primary that, that puts Israel back as, as, the, as the leader of all the nations. Now, you see your Messiah in a locked room appearing as some sort of deity ghost. What's the first thing that you would think? He is here for payback. He is here to get even. We are going to receive punishment. And what's the first thing that Jesus says to them? He extends, in our context, extends his hand and says, peace be with you. I don't have a weapon. I'm not here to kill. I'm not here to harm. I'm here to care. And that will be the marker of exactly who you are as disciples of Christ moving out into the world. You want to be a blessing? Be a helper, not a warrior. You want to be a caregiver? Be a caregiver, not a conqueror. It's fascinating. The first thing that Jesus says in his post-resurrected state is not, we're here to take over. Move out of the way. I got this. You are all in trouble. Instead, he says, peace be with you. There's nothing in my hands except wounds. Now, why do you doubt? Why do you stress? Why are you afraid? Let's go and care for people. Let's go and be a blessing to the world like we were always meant to be. This is God humbling himself to the place of a, ser a servant, an injured God showing his wounds, not yielding a sword or a weapon, but instead extending his hand of peace, saying, peace be with you, go and do the same. My peace will go with you as you go, as you go into the world, explaining and exemplifying peace. My spirit, my presence will be with you. What's the calling card, the commercial for these people of the way, for us as Christ followers today? It is peace. It is peace. It's compassionate engagement, making the world a better place when we, when we leave it than when we came into it. This is the calling card of the Christian church, brothers and sisters. When we shake hands and say, peace be with you, it's extending the work of Christ that began back then. It's not arbitrary. When we shake hands, we say, I was never meant to have a weapon. I'm always meant to exemplify peace. Peace be with you, with us. Jesus appears to them explains like what this will look like from then on. And it's amazing what the early church did, what those first disciples did, all of whom were killed, ne none of whom took up arms, all of whom were willing to die for their faith, never willing to kill, because this was like the cost. It's like, oh, if we die, great, we're with Jesus, but at least we've made a difference in the world. We're no longer willing to pick up swords. We're no longer willing to pick up guns. We're no longer willing to harm all that we are is helpers, exemplifying Christ. So why did Jesus do this? Well, motivation, motivation to inspire us with a new way of being, that peace isn't just intellectual, it's practical, it's tactile, it's what we do with our hands, our feet, our bodies. Um, he, he, like, he, he counters their narrative of like failure, we've screwed up, we, we've, we've done wrong, uh, their own fear with caregiving reconciliation 
and anger. And so maybe today you're feeling the same way, whether it be the state of the world right now, you're feeling, this is a failure, I am terrified. Maybe it's the state of our church and you're like, this is a failure, I'm terrified. Maybe it's the state of your own internal world or your family and you're like, this is a failure, I'm terrified. May the words of Christ saturate your heart and mind. May you know that Jesus is caregiving, is reconciling all things to himself and is intending that we do the same, that we're part of the active work of Christ through peace in our world. Brothers and sisters, peace be with you, with us, it's who we are. So, Megan, in terms of this, uh, this campaign, like, how do you see this like, bearing itself out? Yeah, that's a great question, Jimmy. So, um, yeah, what does this mean for the season of our church life as we make peace and not just keep peace? Oh. So first, let's look at the Beatitudes. Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be known as the children of God. I'd love to be known as a child of God. Mm-hmm. What an awesome calling card. Peacemaking's not an easy endeavor, though. It's not simply being peaceful. It requires actively making peace with our neighbors, our families, and the, and the world. It might mean that you're called to serve in a dangerous place, helping people overcome violent conflict. It might mean that you're called to say hi to that crotchety neighbor who complains about anything and everything. And it might mean that you're called to apologize for snapping at your roommate who left dirty dishes in the sink again. (laughs) Peacemaking is active. I recently had a chance to chat with Jason Sapolwa, who's the restorative justice coordinator for MCC in Zambia. As part of his work, he's helping the Zambia Correctional Services move from a system of punishment to a system of correction and restoration. I could have chatted with him all day, hearing his stories and learning about what peace building looks like in his context. Uh, He had some really inspiring stories of people who wanted to apologize to the victims of their crimes Mm. and make it right and restore the relationship. And that happened in some instances. It's really easy to think of restorative justice as repairing the harm that's been done, but that's actually the second step. The first step of restorative justice is community building you can't restore a relationship that was never there to begin with. Mm -hmm. The pursuit of meaningful relationships is essential to peacemaking. Relationships help us to see the humanity on the other side. And a lot of our divides exist because we don't actually know each other. Peacemaking won't be easy, and it's not always possible. However, as Christians, we're still called to seek it. We remember Paul's words for peacemakers in Romans 12, 18, If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Back to you. Yeah. So you started with the the Sermon on the Mount. So the Sermon on the Mount uh, is like Jesus, like the the record of Jesus' largest body of teaching uh, in Matthew 5, in the beginning of uh, Matthew's gospel. Uh, And again, it's it's an amazing call to non-arms that he starts with. So Jesus is giving a sermon to uh, a mixed group of people, people who are Gentiles, who are uh, impoverished, who are shut out by religion, and then also like some insiders, some, um, you know, young leaders who have also been ostracized, shut out by their own religion. And he gives a sermon He gives uh, talking points for what life will look like. And the Sermon on the Mount, if you're familiar with it, he talks about like how to pray, how not to worry, how to use your money. But then he has uh, the Beatitudes, the blessing portion uh, that he goes through in in the the beginning of Matthew uh, chapter five. Um, And again, this is um, for a purpose. And so see if you can answer this question. When we hear like the blessing of God, what's conjured up in your mind? For some of us, it might be like, well, like, life goes smoothly. Like, we kind of have safe passage through this life, you know. My mental and physical health and family health are okay, and I have a good church experience on Sunday morning. And all of those things are okay. But if you go back, when you hear about the blessing of God as, a, as an ancient Israelite, you would be thinking about the covenant that God made with Abraham, which was that I will use you and your family to multiply, to grow, and you will be a something to the world. What is that? A blessing to the world. You will be a blessing 
to the world. You will be an unstoppable force of good, which we've used that term a lot over the last little while in our church. You'll be an unstoppable force of good in the world. And Jesus comes back to that very thing. It's like, you Israelites, you people of, of religious orientation, do you want to know what God's blessing looks like? Do you want to know what it looks like? Well, let me tell you. And he goes through a number of different um, things. God blesses you when. God blesses you if. God blesses you when you are. And then for today, God blesses those who work for peace, for they will be called the children of God. Now, again, as an ancient Israelite, who are the children of God? It's us. It's the Israelites. So this, again, was both an encouragement and a correction This was like a keep going, but also turning over the rocks to show our blind spots of where we've become a little bit complacent. It was an invitation to peace making, not peace keeping. Do you see the difference there? Peace keeping is like, well, it's my peace. It's my inner world. It's my peace. It's it's how I'm doing inside and my own like, you know, insular community. And, And that's not necessarily wrong, but peace keeping should lead to peace making. And that is the call of Christ for us is to move out into the world, to be the first line of defense in supporting and caring for local and global poverty, for local and global uh, brothers and sisters who are marginalized, for restorative efforts around the world, of giving of our own uh, time and talents to serve those that are less fortunate, not as an add-on to our ministry, but as the focal point for who we are as a church. God blesses those who work for peace, for they will be called children of God. God blesses those who work for peace, for they will be called children of God. And throughout, throughout this, this series and also this, uh, our, our campaign, we've talked about, like, what does the inner, outer world uh, look like? What does it mean to, to have peace that exists within us that then moves its way out? And then as a church, through the evolution of the Meeting House, through our Peacemakers campaign and our compassionate initiatives, like, what do we do today with this? T- today, within the next hour, within the next day, within the next week, within the next month. It's okay to have peace within and, you know, uh, move towards your own shalom aleichem, your peace within. But what does it mean to exude the peace of of Christ that's, that's moved into action outside. So I'm, I'd love to just turn it over to you, Megan. I mean, mm-hmm. you are like, you and your team are on the ground actioning this out each and every day. So help us, like, what, what can we do within the next hour, within the next day, within the next week, and certainly within the next month? Over to you. Take us home. Absolutely. Thanks, Jimmy. Um, it's really exciting to be able to be peacemakers in our communities. Yeah. Peacemaking is the heartbeat of who the church is. It's the chance to be the hands and feet of Jesus to others in our lives, extending the handshake to those we come across. So in practical steps, what does that mean for you? In the next hour, say hi to someone you might not know yet. Introduce yourself as you walk out of church. When you fist bump and say hands and and say hi, uh, remember that that's an extension of peace. Shake hands and pass the peace, remembering that we are laying down our weapons. And this is a historic example of who we are as Christians. Peacemaking starts with community building, and this is the mission and movement of Jesus. In the next day, consider what you can give to the Peacemakers campaign in support of MCC's peacebuilding work around the world. Today's our last day, and we would love to be able to um, support MCC's really valuable work in places like Iraq and um, Zambia and Ontario and all over the place. And uh, so... Consider what you could give. In the next week, look outside your door and notice those around you. Book a time to get to know your neighbors, even if it means sitting on your front lawn with a jug of lemonade. I highly recommend it, and your plants will never be more watered. (laughs) Um, Funnily enough, as I was prepping this, one of my neighbors called me uh, to let me know that I'd left my car door open uh, and that she'd closed it for me. There's something to be said for building relationships with the people who surround you every day, who you're just there by virtue of the fact that you live on the same street. For some of your neighbors, maybe you know them, but you haven't gotten together with them in a while. Invite them over to your backyard for a drink. Say hi as you're mowing the lawn. Maybe that neighbor you don't know, get to know them. Extend peace to them. Let's pray. Jesus, May we be people not bound with fear or peacekeeping, but people who are peacemakers, extending a hand to brothers and sisters in need. 
may we be people who work for peace. And Lord, may our words be peace with you. In Jesus' name, amen. As we wrap up this series on peacemakers, if there are any outstanding questions that you might have, you can ask them at ask at the And as we're thinking about what it means to be a peacemaker in today's world, one of the ways that we can continue to have those conversations and find ways to be practically involved with others in the church is by joining a home church. If you're interested in home church and would like to know more, you can go to themeetinghouse.com slash home church. I hope you all have an incredible Sunday, and I hope to see you again soon. Take care.